For those of you who are wondering, Yesu is, uh, again, the Latin version of Jesus. So we have the Hebrew, Yeshua. We have it also in English, Jesus, and then in Latin, Yesu. Please be seated. I invite the young people to come forward at this time, please. Wow, you guys seem pretty mellow today. You didn't get something sugary for breakfast or what? Man, okay, I need some help though. I'm going to have you help me if you don't mind. Okay, you're going to have to grab one side of this. Let's see. That'll work. Okay, so we're going to unravel this. Come on, come on over. Come on. Well, should we show them what we're looking at? Okay, so let's go turn around quick. Okay. So we got a, a little map of America, okay? So let's go back. So... Have you been to all of these places? We'll start off. Where do you think, where do you think we, on this map, where do you think we, we live? You going to point it out? All right, yeah, over in this area, right there. Okay, good job. So, have you, any of you been to anywhere else on this map? Yeah? Where? You've been down to Idaho? Uh-huh, and you? You've been to California, Oregon. Okay. They're surprised. We, we've been to Oregon? Hmm. California. Okay. Well, a map is, you know, helps guide you along the way. And I feel like the Bible is sort of like a map. It gives you clues about uh, life and, and how to go through life. You can ignore it to your own peril, but sometimes it's really helpful to do that. So, for instance, if you have this map and, uh, and you, you come down here, for instance, to Florida. Now, if you go down to Florida, it's a little different than here. You want to wear a lot of sunscreen. If you, if you don't, you, and you're allowing the water, even this time of year, you get really sunburned. Now, I could go down there. I've walked along the water for about eh, 15 minutes. I figured it wasn't a big deal. I was burned red, kind of like, uh, well, I don't even see anything that red around here, goodness. Redder than the pink on the flower back there. I, I just look like, man, I had, someone made me into a candy cane. I look so red that quickly. So there's more to it. And in a way, that's what the Bible helps us to learn as we go along. Or, for instance, if, if you go up in this area, particularly in the wintertime, you better have your coat on, right? Because if you're up here, it gets really cold. It makes what we have here like nothing. And you might actually have how much snow you might think could you get. 
This much now? Yeah. This much now? Yeah. This much now? Oh, yeah. yeah, some of these places get that much snow. I drove through up here one point going through this area and they got what they call lake effect and it dumps lots of stuff on New York where lots of people are going to see the, see the um, eclipse. But get so much snow that, and uh, driving along and I could barely see the windshield wipers are doing this and there was at least three feet of snow on the ground and more coming. So a little different than we live there. And then if you go out here in the summertime, what do you think you're going to see? Corn. What's that? Desert. Desert. No, not there. This is corn country. I had someone from another country came and visit and they said, I went to sleep on the train and I woke up on the train the next day and all I could see is corn. I woke, went to sleep, woke up, corn. It's like, wow, corn, 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 corn. Whereas he, where he lived, if you went that many miles, you'd be in a whole other country. So this is the corn area. So maps can be really helpful. And over life, who knows, you might go to some of these places. I've been blessed. I've been to every one of these states other than, let's see, where is it at? Eh, I don't see who, oh, Hawaii's down here. That's the only one I haven't been to. They're all different. But you know what's the same about it? People. Every place I go, people have a lot of similarities. They all need to know the love of God, and they need God's guidance. And so when I look at a map like this, it's kind of fun to think about where God might take me and my family, maybe you in the future. You might see a little few of the holes in there. Those little holes are places that we've been. But with that, we also need this God's guidance in that. And so when you read your Bible, you can kind of read it through and go, eh, whatever, and ignore it. But I would hope that you would learn something from it because it gives you guidance like a map and can keep you safe and guide you along the way, but also give you sort of a vision of where you could go. Yeah? The map is kind of like Jesus because Jesus guides you through your life and the map guides you through your country. Sounds good to me. You could have said it a little louder, though. No one else heard it. <laughs> You're saying that Jesus guides you through your life. And he died for us. That's wonderful. Okay. Anything else you want to go? Anywhere else you want to think about in this map? So if you come over here to Maine, New Brunswick, you'll see something really amazing if you're near the water. The water, they have the tides go in and out. And the tides, okay, so water comes in, in the, you know, like when a certain time of the day it comes in, like maybe this high. Well, there it comes in, and it's like 20 feet in the air. So you'll see the water go out during the day and come back in 20 feet. Can you imagine that much water going in and out during a time? That's a lot of water, isn't it? So all throughout this country, there's amazing things. And part of what this makes this country amazing is each one of you here because you are special in God's eyes and God loves you. And I hope you remember that throughout this day. Gracious God, thank you, by the way. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your guide that you would give us the Bible. But thank you for each one of these young people who make this part of the country special too, what gifts and abilities you put in them. May they grow into that and share them throughout their life. We pray in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay. I would invite you to stand at this time as we sing our next hymn.
Please be seated. Lift up your hearts. This reading comes from the book of Acts. After his, that is Jesus, sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Holy One, may we think about those early disciples and as they waited and waited for your spirit to, to empower them, may we too remember your resurrection and may we too be empowered by your spirit to live our lives differently as you give us the strength to do so. Amen. So what next is going to happen? You know the disciples are asking that. You know, Jesus rose from the dead. They're, he's showing up in various places. We're told that he appeared to hundreds of folks. Those had been open to him while he wandered around and, and healed and all that. And they're going, well, what's going to go on? What would your desire to be at that point? Hey, bring back an army. Change the world. Or, Lord, you know, things aren't going too well. Now you're gone, but we're glad you're alive. Give us some wisdom about the future. And you know they're asking that. Well, I think at times we're asking that too. We went through a, a disaffiliation. And as a group, we're now beyond that. We've still got a, maybe one or two more details. But it seems like things are really pretty solid. We got money that came in, allowed us to do that. What's next? Well, I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> Bert raises hands. What next? Well, I like to talk about that. What next is that, that place of, like the disciples, after Jesus' resurrection, they're asking that question, what comes next? But we are told where there is no vision, the people perish. That image is that where there is no sense of the, the, the Spirit of God giving you guidance, the people go off and do whatever. And because of that, they perish. They forget that there's a God. They do a variety of things. They get involved in things that take them away further and further from the Spirit. Some of it may be what appear to be even good things, but they, they eventually fail at that. So there is a need for a vision, a vision that God gives us. There needs to be an openness, though, to receive that vision. Jesus was speaking with the disciples just before his death, and the cross and the resurrection. And he was telling them in this Passover meal, again, the Passover meal is a remembering of what went on with Moses and the disciples in those early Israelites as they came out of Egypt. And he was doing that for a purpose. He could easily have had the experience of going to Jerusalem at another time. But he went at a specific time, giving them particular information and revelation, if you will, to help guide them into the future. And I think it's true for us today as well, that we need to, to remember these stories, not just something from the past, but also a way of a direction into the future, particularly around vision. Because they're in Egypt, that is, the story goes with Moses is taking him to Egypt. And they go to Moses and, and they're asking him, what about what's going to happen next? Well, Moses had some specific things that he was, he was known for. He has compassion for the people that he's with. It isn't because, ah, uh, well, God told me to. He's not like Jonah. Jonah's like, ah, uh, real different. Moses was chosen because he has compassion. Tell us a little bit about God. He sent someone that loved them. He understands their plight. Just like God, I'm sure he knows their situation. He grew up in Egypt. He actually got in a fight over trying to keep a, someone from a, afflicting another a Hebrew slave. And he had to fled because of that, or flee because of that. He longed for change. So here he is out there years later, tending sheep. And I'm sure he's still going, oh, man. I wonder how my folks are doing people that he loves. I suspect a little bit like Priscilla at times, wondering about how her folks are in Zimbabwe. Or our friends back in Nicaragua, wondering how their folks are doing back at home. And suffering, 
internally about that. Well, he was feeling the same way. But he sees the world differently. And what I mean by that, he doesn't just see it fixed. He, he has a moment where he encounters the living God. And what's different about that is he believes God's word. That is God speaking to him, that God can change things. And we're invited to do the same, that we're, we're called to be persons who see the world differently and believe that God can change things, that God can move in our lives. God can move what seems to be impossible. The Israelites, that is, the people that had been in Egypt, again, trailing down the history, we had Joseph go to Egypt with his family. Over generations, they grow in larger and larger numbers, and eventually the Egyptians there use them as slaves, and under the cruelty of what's going on, they were even told to, well, drown the, el- the, ch- the male children. And that's why Moses is particularly unique in that way. He was able to escape that. But drown the male ones, we'll keep the women as slaves. They had no power, they had no influence. They couldn't do anything in terms of afflicting the Pharaoh. He was the one in control and his family. All they could do was pray. And I've heard that from people. I can't do anything. All I can do is pray, Pastor. It kind of feels like, dang, you're really in trouble now, aren't you? There seems like a little hopelessness in that statement. All I can do is pray. Well, what happened with them? They prayed, and God heard, right? Maybe not as quickly as they wanted, but God did hear the prayer and sent Moses to them to say, come out. And so this story, this experience is told over and over again in the generations. And there's archaeological evidence that the Hebrew people are, in fact, in Egypt. It wasn't just a myth that went on and thought, well, this is a pretty cool story. Let's keep telling it. It's something that occurred, and they were brought out by the uh, efficacy of God's hand. You've got to keep that in mind that Jesus is telling his disciples about this. Why? Well, what is it about God's action that they need to come to realize? When Jesus dies and is upon the cross, and how many, er, er, how many of them are there? Maybe a dozen guys, right? And then all those that have seen about it. They're in a land that would particularly was holding them down. The Romans, uh, Roman uh, army was there. There were folks within the Jewish community that didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah by any means. It looked pretty bleak. So he's telling them about where God moves in those moments. Amazing things can occur. Another one is this story out of 1 Kings. It's an amazing story of this woman that is outside of the normal realm of Israel. She's not a, a, a Israelite herself. And so we hear this story. This is about a prophet, Elijah, going there. So he, that is Elijah, went to Zarephatha. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? Seems pretty innocent up to this point. As she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and by the way, bring me, please, a piece of bread. And this is her reply. As surely as the Lord your God lives, because she's not an Israelite, she says, as surely as the God your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little olive oil in a jug, and I'm gathering a few sticks here to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Wow. Hmm. As surely as your God lives. In other words, she's saying, well, tell you the truth. All I got is enough to go home, eat a little snack, and die. And this is Elijah's response. He said to her, do not be afraid. I don't know if that's a very good translation. I imagine fear is just one part of it. Don't be so despondent. I'm sure he's what he's saying. It's okay. Why? Go home and do as I have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and a jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain upon the land. Well, until the crops start growing again. 
She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her son. Wow. I wish I could go to the gas station and have a pump that always worked all the time, right? Without putting the credit card in. She goes from a place of utter despondency. She encounters the prophet. She encounters, I would say, the vision. She has a word of the Lord to her that says, it's going to be okay. Maybe not great. You're not going to be real fancy, but you're going to have food to eat, and it will be okay. And she lives into that. And it kind of ticks off the people of Israel later on because it's, when the story's told, they realize that Elijah didn't go and eat to anybody that was within Israel itself because they had done such evil deeds that they were not open to the Spirit of God. Instead, this woman was outside of it, and Elijah goes to her, and that's where the miracle happens. She was open in spite of her immediate or in initial response of, well, as your God lives, she was still open to the God of the universe to move in her life and do the impossible, seemingly. Now, does it end there? No, the story goes on. Her son dies, and she goes to the prophet and says, thanks a lot. You fed us, and now she, he, my son died. And Elijah says, wait a second. Prays a little bit, and her son comes back to life. The impossible becomes possible when the vision of God enters in. Not our vision, not your vision necessarily, but when God's vision breaks in, the impossible becomes possible. So what are some of the qualities of those who accept the vision? Because obviously there has to be certain openness about it. Well, I would suggest there's several things. One, there's longing for change. If you're comfortable and things are okay with you, you're probably not going to be saying, God, I need something to change. I hear about folks coming through our pantry line or the clothing line saying, I need change. They're longing for it. Secondly, they're prayerful. I love the Psalms. Jesus obviously loved the Psalms because he read them over and over again and he used them throughout his ministry. He quotes the Psalms more than anything else. Some of those Psalms are longing for God to intervene, to, to keep them safe, to change the world around them. So prayerfully, not just, oh, well, Lord, you, you forgot me again today. Lord, I come to you because you are the one that can change things. I long for a change in this world. May my longings and your willingness to change things come together. But there's also a willingness to take risks. You notice that when the prophet said there, well, go home and, and do what? Make a little bread, right? She just said to him, I don't have much. She's given the very last of what she has to him. What if he's wrong, right? What if he's just a fake? She took a risk. There's something about Elijah and, his, and who he was and the spirit she encountered when he met him to say, I'm willing to take that risk. And so she put some skin in the game. It reminds me of Ron, actually. When we were having the discussion about going to disaffiliation, he stands up and he says, folks, we need to put skin in the game. <laughs> there are times when we need to take those risks. And if we don't, if this woman had not done that, what would have happened? Probably her and her son would have died because they did not take the risk. And it's consistent with often when God speaks to people, they have to take a risk to trust God. Often in those moments, you may say, well, God, give me some assurance, but there's still risk involved. And the last one is you run out of options. I, and this part I don't like. It's like, really? Do I have to go through another Good Friday experience? You know, it looks pretty bleak right now, and I don't have any other options right now. Lord, maybe you could answer a little sooner. You ever feel that way? The car just died. The bills have come in. Somebody gets a cold. You get fired. All that kind of comes together and you're going, dang, Lord, help. <laughs> Lisa's shaking her head, yes. And I think somebody else that had gotten a broken hand not long ago felt a little bit like this. You're out of options. But it's precisely when there's, you're out of options that is when you see the miraculous intervene. 
Some of you say, I want to see big miracles. Well, often big miracles are also accompanied with big intervention, which means things aren't going well. I haven't prayed for the big miracles because I don't always like what accompanies those big miracles. To bring six million Jews out of Israel, also men that are out of Egypt, meant they were pretty big suffering going on. They longed, though, for a change where it wasn't a top-down Pharaoh kind of idea. And they went into the desert to learn a different way of being together where they learned to share when the, they prayed and God provided manna and they had to share with each other that. They learned to interact with each other. They learned that it isn't just Moses that God would speak to. God gave through Moses the intervention to others that they started learning to discern the Spirit of God and we are as well called to learn that. So when you feel like your options are running out, you have a choice. How are you gonna, what are you going to do? Throw your hands up in the air and give up? Or are you going to go, Lord, I'm in this moment and I need your intervention? Then God moves in the miraculous. But when God does, don't expect all the problems to go away. As in the case of this woman whose son dies later on, it's like, oh my gosh, I got even a bigger problem. But God still moved. There will also be naysayers along the way. And you follow those folks coming out of Egypt. And they get out into the desert and they go, boy, let's go back to Egypt. It was better there. They forget what occurred in Egypt. At least we had this back there. Oh, we shouldn't have done that. Oh, we shouldn't have done this. I've encountered that throughout my ministry. Folks say, eh, shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Why did we plan that special event that day? Shouldn't have done that. Amazing. People still show up. In the midst of naysaying, God still moves. Why we say that is because we can't let the naysayers control our direction going forward. If you're going to follow in the miraculous, you need to be willing to, to say yes. And as I said earlier, we need to put some skin in the game that is part of the process. One of the biggest uh, some years ago, one of the, the biggest uh, churches in Korea was an individual, Yoji Cho. I mentioned this before. Yoji Cho got to the place where he had a vision that the church could grow in leaps and bounds. And it, I, I, at that point, it was relatively small con con considering the 100,000 that eventually it becomes. But what he felt like God said to him was, sell your house, put the money into the church. Jean's shaking her head, no. That's exactly what his wife probably said. No way, we're going to sell our house and put that money to, put a, to grow a church. He had to put big time faith that God was going to do something. And he had obstacles that hit after that over and over again. But the vision that he had grew to 100,000. I think it grew way beyond that even. What is the vision God has for this place? In the last one, it's easier to see it in the river mirror than when you, it's in front of you. And I think most of us can say that. Ah, yes. Now that we're beyond the Good Friday and, e and, and Easter Sunday, I can see in the river mirror what God was doing. But on the front end of that, on Good Friday, were you going to see it? Not so easy, right? They weren't too sure what was going to happen. We often enter those places. So I invite you. So what do you say? Do we stay with what we know? Do you want to continue going along what we've done in the past? I kind of like the familiar. How about you? Or are we going to risk and trust that God will be with us going into the unknown? That's the question that this woman who ran out of options had to ask herself. Am I willing to risk for my son and myself the miraculous? The Hebrew people had to risk big time. They can do the Passover meal and to get themselves ready and they'll be able to leave Egypt and trust that God was going to go with them, knowing that there's probably an army that was going to come after them and they were going to face difficulties out in the desert. But here we are, some 4,000 years later, still remembering that story of God's intervention. What do you want to be known of you in 100 years? We all have that choice. I'd like to have you
turn in your Bible in your pew to Psalm 91. And this actually was reminded me this last week with Judy. Judy mentioned this to us. Psalm 91. I don't see the page number on here. I guess it got cut off. But I know there's a Psalm 91. So open up your Bible about the middle. Let it break open in about the middle. You'll probably hit the Psalms. And then go to 91. Verse 14. So you can go to verse 14. And I'd like to have us read this together. And why I'm saying that is because often we think about the Christian walk as being solitary. It's by myself. And there's some level that we have to make those choices each day to follow or, or not. But it's also a community experience that we're called together to support and encourage each other, to be there for each other, to learn how to do that. And that's why I think it's helpful at times to do responses. So I'm going to ask this side over here to start off with the first verse where it starts with because and read through him. And then we'll go to this side and read the next part. I will protect him, my name, and go back and forth to remind ourselves that we have been given promises by God to be with us in those challenges and difficulties. And as a community, we are here to support and encourage each other to grow in faith and knowledge and love. So if you would on this side, let us say together, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. And then over here, I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. Decide. I will be with him in trouble. Over here. I will deliver him and honor him. Again, life. I will satisfy him. And together, and show him my salvation. Again, we're dealing with some churchy words here. The word troubles to service. Troubles. Troubles. All of us face troubles in our life. It isn't just him, it's us. I will be with us in trouble, and I will deliver them and honor them, and I will give them long life. You go to certain parts of Africa right now, and my son would be an old man because of decimation of diseases. I I would be really an old man. Some of you would be like ancient. (laughs) Kidding. (laughs) But seriously... There are places there where older persons just don't, aren't there anymore because of disease. It's tragic. I mention that because we are told that God will give us long life and show us the salvation, God's healing. It isn't just a message for us. It's a message for this world that we're called to bear. It's a message that we're called to bring out, and that's part of my desire as a people here, that we share it with this community, that God loves them and that we are part of that salvation to those around us. But we have to know it ourselves too, that each one of you here needs to know that God loves you, and God will protect you, and God will be there when you call upon him, and God will be with you in troubles and honor you and give you a long life and show you salvation, which is healing of heart, mind, and soul. Or we could stand on the side and do whatever. For myself, I'd rather go this way, I hope you will join together and see the salvation of God move in our midst. Amen? Amen. So at night, if you're going to go to bed, and I think Judy was saying that she just sometimes does this when she's feeling troubled, she reads that part to herself. Lord, you have promised this, and it's a prayer, and I believe it's a prayer that Jesus read over many a time as well. But in the midst of that, he saw his life as a way of calling others to know the salvation of God's presence. So he was willing to suffer and express love in ways that many of of us are incapable of doing. But through that, he has opened the door that we might encounter love in God's presence that we've been close to as well. Holy One, I pray again for this gathering that we might encourage each other, support each other, to know your ways, your salvation, and as we do so, Lord, may we then live into faith and take the risks, the risks that you call us to. And through that then, like the story of the folks of Egypt and like this woman who saw her satisfied, may we too see in our lives 
your glory, your presence, we pray. Amen. At this time, I would invite you to stand and we bring the offertory plates forward as we sing again our next hymn. They're not here. With you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator of the universe, our light and our salvation. Before the sun shone and the earth was formed, you alone dwelt. You created then from the void, penetrating the darkness with light. Your spirit moved upon the face of the waters and you brought order and form in life from the dust of the earth. Out of love, you formed all that is and placed us as stewards of the earth. However, we have repeatedly turned away from you, corrupting the very gift you have given us. Yet your great love has remained steadfast. When the time was right, you sent your son Jesus to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and revealed him as your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he overcame the power of sin and death. Your spirit anointed him to bring your message of hope, help to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, healing to the brokenhearted. Through his actions, the sick were healed, the hungry were fed, sinners transformed, and the dead were raised. By the, baptism of, by the baptism of his death and resurrection, you then you gave birth to your church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death, which divides our spirits in very life. However, through his covenant, signed by his blood, we have been reconnected to you and each other. Because of this, at his ascension, you exalted him and had him sit at your right hand, where according to his promise, he is always with us baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Therefore, with your people in all ages and the whole company of heaven, we join in unending praise, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy One, we are thankful that you then bring us to this table. The table, again, is as an expression of your love. Knowing that the cross stood before you, though, you took bread and broke it and gave thanks. Turning to your disciples, he said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Holy when you were broken upon the cross, but not in vain, but in a way to express both your power and the transformation of this world, which is so often broken. As we experience brokenness in our lives and we look around the world around us and see the brokenness, we too are persons that experience pain and sorrow. We are troubled by what we see and we invite your spirit to come and bring healing, to help others to live long lives, to help others to, to experience your grace, 
but also those who we see in our midst that they too might know and taste of your goodness. Only one, you follow the dinner with raising a cup again and saying to your disciples and to us, take, drink, all of you. This is my blood which is poured out for your sins. Do so in memory of me. Holy One, as we drink of this cup and eat of this bread, may we receive the antidote to the brokenness of this world, knowing that you poured yourself out, but you also did the miraculous. You raised us up with you. In the resurrection, we too have the promise of resurrection and transformation. May your spirit be upon these gifts and upon all who gather here, both on the camera but also in presence. May they know the surety of your love for them, be transformed by it and live their lives differently because of your many graces that we've experienced. In the breaking of this bread, too, we are reminders that we are often broken, and yet you bring us back to yourself. And so we give you thanks and praise, enjoying with the company of heaven and giving thanks, as we have said this day. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, then all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, again, for their restoration and healing and also hope in the days when it may appear darkest. If you'd like to receive the cup, the antidote to the brokenness world, I would invite you to do so in the rear of the church, or if you'd like to come forward, please do so at this time. Would you like to help? Yeah. Would you like to help, Bob? Thank you.
Only when we are again thankful for the gift of your presence and also for the calling that you have placed upon our lives to share the love that you place in our hearts with those that you place in our lives. May you give us guidance to do so this day, we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as we sing our next hymn. So the next two hymns are pretty rousing, so, you know, try to contain yourself. No, <laughs> they really are wonderful hymns, so if you want to clap a little bit or dance a little bit, it's allowed, okay. Gracious God, again, as we come to learn and experience your grace, guide us. Give us a sense of vision. May your spirit of peace, though, go before us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit, may you go from this place, knowing of God's love for you and God's grace carrying you through each day. Amen. Amen. Where my sin and bear. 
Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declares the grave has no claim on me. Jesus Christ, you are our living hope. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.